Now, I want to speak very loudly here to you. If you're like that and you've lived your life under the condemnation that something happened in your life that you can't get past, today is your day to understand that God loves you and God wants to forgive you and God wants you to put that in the past and God wants you to live a family life that is free of this judgment and condemnation. God wants you to live with the joy of the Lord and to know His love. Welcome to Loving Christ, connecting God's Word to God's people one verse at a time. None of us have perfect families because all of us live in a world broken by sin, which impacts every area of our lives, including our families. Perhaps you've experienced trouble in your family. Perhaps you've been discouraged by a family member or have experienced favoritism or unforgiveness in your family that wounded you. The truth is you are not alone and you are not beyond the reach of the love of God who knows your pain and desires to see you healed and whole. On today's episode of Loving Christ, we begin a new sermon series on the book of 1 Samuel. Over the next several weeks, the first part of this sermon series will examine trouble in the family and God's remedy for what ails us. No matter how hard we try, we cannot fix ourselves, and while we might ask God to fix a particular problem or a particular person, the truth is we must allow Him to heal us first. And that's the focus of the message Dr. Keith Zachary brings us today. Now let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel and prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God. And now, here's Dr. Zachary. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Samuel, 1 Samuel. We're starting a new series this morning entitled Facing Trouble. Facing Trouble. And uh, we're going to look at trouble in the family first. Uh, that's what we have in the first part of Samuel. Then trouble in the faith. That comes next. And then trouble with the first king. And basically, that outlines areas of trouble that we have in life, in our family, in our churches, in our governments. So basically, we're looking at God addressing those uh, troubles that we have, and we're starting where we should start, with the family. Actually, our churches can be no stronger than our families. I've said that many times before. Your family should model what you hope the church will be, and I do pray that uh, that is something you think of often. My family should be a model of what I hope our church should be. And so today we're looking at a family, again, just as we looked at the beginning of Ruth. And I don't know if you see any uh, type of structure in this, but I am preaching Judges on Wednesday night. Uh, We've already gone through Ruth, and now we're in 1 Samuel. We're kind of in these transitional transitional passages of Scripture. Judges is where we have the children of Israel coming into the promised land, but they're just getting settled. So it's a transition for them. Ruth in the time of Judges is also a book of transition that we talked about, and we've gone through a Ruth trusting God, and now we're in 1 Samuel as they are coming to another transition, that is the children of Israel coming to another transition from having no king to having a king, that is leaving the time and period of Judges and coming to the time of the kingdom. So we'll be looking at a king. And the person we're introduced to is the person whose name Uh, is given for the book for Samuel. Samuel is the individual who's going to close out the time of Judges and anoint the first king and the second king. He's going to anoint both of those. So Samuel will live to anoint the two, the first two kings of Israel. He himself, that is Samuel, will serve kind of as a last judge. And also Eli, a priest, served for, for 40 years as judge, the Bible tells us. So we're closing out that period as Eli will die, the king will be anointed, and we'll come to that. But right now, today, with your Bibles open to 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're looking at a family, just as we did in Ruth. We looked at a family to start uh, the, the study in Ruth, and this is facing difficulties or facing trouble. So look with me at chapter 1 and stand with me in honor of the Word of God and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Chapter 1 of 1 Samuel. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, or Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimathite. Now let me say something about that, and we're going to come back to it. 
when we look at these names and we look at the father of and the son of and things like that, you need to keep that in your mind because you're going to see it. It's not possible for you to remember it, but if you have any references, for example, this is going to reference First Chronicles chapter 6. How many of you have a reference to First Chronicles chapter 6 in your Bible? Look that up, and we'll make reference to it in just a moment. But I want you to see something uh, at the end. He's an Ephraimite, an Ephraimite. He's not from Ephraim. Uh, that is to say, this is not his tribe, but this is a place. It's talking about where he lives, basically, in the mountains of Ephraim. would be like me saying, I'm a Louisianian. That's true. I'm an American. That's true. I'm a Christian. That's true. How many references can we give? Well, we're talking about this man, man, Elkanah, and he is an Ephraimite in the sense that that's where he lives. That's not his tribe. First Chronicles will tell you that, and I'll say more. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, and Hannah had no children. So we're introduced to the Nah family. So we have Elkanah, Penina, Hannah, you get it, okay. And this man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, some people say Phinehas, uh, the priest of the Lord were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina and also to her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he would give double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, Penina, also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, and therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And so Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke with her heart, and only her lips moved, but her heart, her voice was not heard. And therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away or went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. And then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that she conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I've asked him of the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, speak to our hearts today. Help us to realize that we must face the troubles that we encounter in life. And Father, in our homes and under the roof of what we call our homes, Lord, we know that there may be things even today that must be addressed. You brought people here from various places, but many of them have similar problems. And I pray, dear Father, you teach us this morning what you want of us in our homes, in our families. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Facing trouble in the family, first of all. 
If I, if I were writing this, of course, this is inspired of God, and I'm not questioning the inspired Word of God, but I'm just saying that it would have been easy for me if I were thinking about the contents of the letter or the, uh, the book of Samuel, the, the book of Samuel, I would have probably said there was a man, a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, who begot a son named Samuel by his wife Hannah, chapter 2. But that's not what God wanted written. He did not want to bypass the fact that there was trouble in this family. He wanted that to be mentioned. Why? Because there will be trouble in families, even good families, even families from whence come men like Samuel. And we like to think, well, here's a man, a great man of God. He must have come from a family that was just just absolutely wonderful. They didn't have any problems in the family, but that's not true. There were troubles in the family from whence Samuel came. And God wanted us to hear about it, know about it, and he wanted us to consider it today even. This is not an accident that we're here. It's not a coincidence that I'm here, you're here, and we're talking about trouble in the family. So maybe there's trouble in your family. And so many times the trouble is uh, not only in the family throughout the week, but it doesn't stop on the journey, the trip from home to church. It was manifest this morning. It's amazing how you can have one type of conversation out in the car and walk into the church building and carry on a different type of conversation. We are good at hiding what God wants exposed. We're good at concealing what God places wide open before us in the text this morning, that there was a man who had problems in his family. He had to address these issues, these troubles. So let me just say, first of all, the man himself, Elkanah, let me just say, first of all, that he is not an Ephraimite, just so that you might know. He is from Ephraim, as I said a moment ago. But you know his tribe. Do you know what tribe he's from? Levi. He's a Levite. And you would find that in First Chronicles chapter 6. And as a matter of fact, when David established the individuals who were going to serve in the service of the Lord when he had the ark placed back where it belonged, the ark of the covenant brought back when David brought it back, and he outlined those who would serve in the priesthood. The Bible says that especially he would have the singer Heman, who was the son of Joel, who was the son of Samuel, who was the son of Elkanah. So he's a Kohathite. He is from the son of Levi, Kohath. He's a Kohathite, Elkanah is. And his sons served the Lord, Samuel being one, Joel being his grandson, and then we go on with the others, Heman being a singer, all in the family of Elkanah. So this is a man that you might not know at the beginning is a man of God. He's in the tribe of Levi, of the son of Kohath. He's a Kohathite. And so I just don't know if we would need that information, but I, I think we do. I think we need to know that it's not just uh, it's not just the family sitting in the pew that have problems. It's the family standing behind the pulpits that have the problems as well. Amen? I didn't get an amen from that, but I'll say amen for myself. And if you don't think that's true, wait till we get to Eli. He's another family we have to talk about. But there are problems in families. I'm not excluded from having trouble in my family. And so I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to us. And I think that's important for us to establish that in the very first verse. This is a man of the tribe of Levi. This man should, it's, it's quite fitting for him to have a son that is given to the priesthood, Samuel. It's fitting because this is the tribe of Levi, serves the Lord. So why would he be called an Ephraimite? Because he lives there. You remember that the tribe of Levi, they they didn't have any lands assigned to them. They might be living anywhere in service to the Lord. So he just happens to be living in Ephraim. He's an Ephraimite, but he is a Levite of the house of Koath. And so that's important for you to know, just so we all can feel comfortable. 
just so I can just agree with you and we can bond and say, you know this trouble. I know this trouble. We have trouble in our families. Now, I'll have to say that Elkanah probably invited trouble in the sense that the first thing we hear of him is he has two wives. That's not a good thing. How many of you know having two wives is not a good thing? All right. So he's a man of God. He's of the tribe of Levi. He's of the family of Koath. And he has two wives. So he kind of invited trouble into his family. Why does he have two wives? I'm not really sure I can say this uh, with any degree of accuracy, but I'm going to guess with a certain amount of certainty that he probably married Hannah first and didn't have any children. This seems to be the way it comes about in having more than one wife in the Old Testament. It's not like God promotes this. I find it interesting that the first person that the Scripture says had two wives is a descendant of Cain, Lamech. He had two wives. That's what the Bible says. And it was not good. And he was not smart. If you just read about Lamech, he was not a smart man. He he killed a man and thought that, well, he thought that God was going to amplify uh, the judgment on people who would harm him for doing that because Cain was marked as a man that couldn't be killed. That's another story. I don't want to get sidetracked. Just to say that the first time we find two wives of one man is in a descendant, the descendants of Cain, not in Seth. That's what we find. However, we have to make mention of the fact that, of course, Jacob had many wives and many sons, and uh, it's just in there. It's not to say, however, that God ever really recommends this. There seems to be trouble that comes from this all the time, and especially, we would say, when you find that one wife particularly is barren, and another wife is blessed with children. This just seems to amplify the problem. So the problem is, first of all, Elkanah has two wives. That's the trouble, two wives. And so let me just show you uh, from the Scripture what the Bible says about those two wives. And indeed, as I've already made mention of the fact that one could bear children and the other could not. And I want you to keep that in your mind as, as a source of contention. The two wives, Penina had uh, the ability, Penina had the ability to have children and Hannah had no ability to have children. She was barren. And if we keep that in mind, that shows a distinct, a very important distinct difference between the two. Having children in this day and being able to bring forth especially a son for your husband to carry on the family name was very, very important. It was the pride of the wife to be able to produce a son for uh, her husband. But Hannah could not have any children. She had none, none at all. And this is the source of a problem. Because from these two wives being so different in a very special and important area... That is, in the ability to bear children, things amp up and problems have become, or the trouble becomes more and more intense. So let me just show you what happens. Here you have, Penina could have children. She did have children. We don't know how many altogether. We know she had sons and she had daughters, plural, both, more than one son, more than one daughter. So she had at least four children. Amen? You got that? At least two sons, at least two daughters. She had sons and daughters. And Hannah had none. But the Bible says, and I want you to see it, two, two wives, verse 5 says, but Hannah, he would give when they went up for a time to worship because he is of the tribe of Levi. He's going to go to the three gatherings annually for worship of God. And so when he's going there, of course, he gives his children, he gives his wives a, a, some type of a portion of all of offering to the Lord, he gave a double portion to Hannah. And the Bible says that is in verse 5, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. Now that's very interesting to me. It is obvious when they go up to worship that he's showing favoritism to Hannah. And it's obvious according to the Scripture because the Bible says specifically that he loved Hannah that Hannah is being shown favoritism and it increases some type of antagonism that comes from Penina in, in her attitude toward Hannah. 
So when we look at this, we begin to realize that some of the contention between the two is really brought on by Elkanah loving Hannah and giving her a double portion because she didn't have children, showing his love for her. And not only that, we can see later that he even says to her in verse 8, Elkanah, her husband, said to Hannah, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? That's pretty arrogant, isn't it? No, but that's not what he's not saying. You know, can't you just be satisfied with me? What he's trying to say to her is that though you have no sons, you have my heart. You have me. I love you, and you know I love you. You know I show love to you, and you know that I honor you. So he is saying something that's very important to the trouble that's in this family, and that is Elkanah showing favoritism. And it is that favoritism that causes this rivalry that comes out between the two women, the two wives. And the rivalry presents somewhat of an unhealthy, and I want you to get this, please follow this because the remainder of the sermon is right here. This is at the core. The rivalry causes a Penina to say some things and do some things, obviously, that are very difficult for Hannah to bear. She knows she has the love of her husband. She knows she has the favor of her husband. But Penina says some things and does some things that are difficult. The rivalry that is mentioned in the Scripture, verse 6, and her rival provoked her severely. Provoked her. Now, hold on just a minute. We're going to bring this to your home and my home in just a second. I don't have two wives. No one in here has two wives, or you would not be here. You would be in jail. It's not legal in this country. But you can have two loves. And I don't mean women either. There can be something you love more than you love your family and competes for your affection all the time. There can be something that in your life gets your attention more than your wife has your attention. I was just hearing this week about about a woman, uh, a, a pastor's wife. And it grieved my heart to hear this story. But I heard a story about a woman, a pastor's wife, who had for years felt like she was second place to her husband. Church was always first. I'm going to just tell you how it comes about in my life. God is first in my life. But second, that's my wife, just so you know. Do you know that? And that's the way it's supposed to be, not just for the pulpit. As I said a moment ago, I'm, we're all addressing this. God is first, but your family, your wife is second, and your family's part of that love. Do you understand? So when you, when you have more than one love in your life, you can begin to shift your affection in such a way that it causes problems. So this is not removed from our experience. It may be that we don't have two wives, but we can have two loves, just so we can relate to what's going on here. But this story, this pastor's wife was so grieved at one point, she was having so many problems that her husband was missing and skirting so that he can continue to minister to his family. This is what she finally said. He said, what do you want from me? And she said, I want you to love me like you love the church. And I thought, how horrible that a pastor's wife feels like She has to compete for her husband's affection with another love in his life, and a legitimate love, obviously. But it can never be that. So I'm looking at the problem in this family, but it's not just in my family. It's in your family as well. It's not just in the leadership of the church. It's not just in the Levites. It's in every family that we can have some competition. Listen, men, I'm going to speak to you just for a moment. This favoritism that was shown toward Hannah was, I think, legitimate because of Hannah's spirit. I think it was legitimate in some sense because he knew that she was going through a very difficult rivalry with 
Penina and what she did to her, I'll talk, to about, talk about next. But I think he was trying always to encourage her, to lift her up. But I will just tell you this, when we have two competing loves in our life, we have to make it known, just to hammer it down for us men, that after God, our wife comes next. Just so you'll know. Now let me get back to Hannah and Penina. We don't have this situation, but Penina is asking for more attention. She's trying to get it in a certain way by creating some type of rivalry between her and Hannah. And we find it in verse 6, her rival, that is, Hannah has a rival, is Penina, and she's provoking her severely to make her miserable. So this is an unhealthy contest that ends in a constant provocation that makes Hannah miserable. So get this right. Two wives, favoritism shown, rivalry, and beyond the rivalry, provocation, provocation to misery. So let me just talk about that just for a second in this case and make application. The favoritism, I think, as I said, was somewhat warranted because of what Penina was doing to Hannah. She was provoking her. And so he had to come along many times and encourage her. And how did Penina provoke Hannah? By always look at it in verse 5. If you didn't recognize it the first time through, look at it in verse 5 and look at it in verse 6. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion for he loved Hannah. That's his love for her, favoritism, because she needed to be lifted up. Although the Lord, look at the last words, the Lord had closed her womb in verse 6. And the rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. You see that. What Penina wanted Hannah to remember continually is the Lord has closed your womb. In other words... God has judged you. You know why you can't have children? Because God has judged you. You're under the judgment of God, Hannah. I mean, the Lord has closed your womb. When this happens, I mean, it's just not natural. We'd have to say that the giving of children is a blessing of the Lord, and you must not be blessed of the Lord. The Lord has closed your womb. So how do you go up to worship three times a year when your rival is always saying, The Lord has closed your womb. The Lord has closed your womb. How do you go and worship when you feel like God has judged you? It's not that she just wanted a child. I believe Hannah wanted to be delivered from this judgment, this sentence that was always being brought to her and reminding her of the fact that God had closed her womb. The Lord has closed your womb. It's a judgment of God. Now imagine with me, we have at least four children born into the family by Penina, maybe more, more sons, more daughters, but we have four children. How long does it take for a child from conception to birth? How long does that take? Usually nine months. So nine months out of the year, we get the announcement. Penina says, I'm having a child. And then from from that conception all the way to birth, it's always something about Penina. Oh, you're starting to show. It's always, oh, wonder what it's going to be. Wonder if it's going to be a boy. Wonder if it's going to be a girl. What kind of names do we have picked out? And Penina has all of this journey going through nine months reminding Hannah that I'm pregnant with child. I am with child and you can't have children because the Lord has closed your womb. And then all of a sudden the birth comes about and and then it's all about the birth. The, the baby's here. Now we know what it is, and now we give it a name. And now it's the year that follows is all the first things. The, the you know the the first time the child does anything. It's an, it's a celebration, right? When the child begins to crawl, when the child begins to talk, when the child begins to walk, when the child, it's always something. And in every celebration, it's a reminder to Hannah: the Lord has closed your womb. You can't celebrate with us here. And I do feel that Penina probably, after having multiple children, kind of began to be in need of a helper. And, of course, Hannah's quick to run over there and pick up a baby and help. And and then at times, I would imagine, just in an attempt to be cruel, because it's her rival, Penina would take the child back and say, that's not yours, that is mine. The Lord has closed your womb. 
I would imagine in the night sometimes when Hannah would awaken to a cry of a baby, it would be a reminder of the Lord has closed your womb over and over and over again. And so you get through the first year of this baby's life, maybe not even the first year of this baby's life, and then an announcement, I'm pregnant again. And it starts all over again and again. And you can't even go up to the house of worship without being reminded the Lord has closed your womb. Let me just say to you and your family, men, love your wife. That's kind of just a side note, but I think that's very, very, very important. It's like a base number one point. If there's a point here, I want you to get that and take it home with you. But number two, there are people in your family who need encouragement because without that encouragement, they can begin to sense that they are not blessed of God they need the blessing of encouragement in their family. And, and sometimes it coming from the dad, it can be greatly, greatly, uh, I guess, a part of that person's growth in their character. When dad can say, you are favored of the Lord, you are loved of God, and remind the children that Jesus Christ came into this world to die for their sins so that they could not only be forgiven but become children of God and encourage them in that love of the Lord. It's very important for families who are having trouble to realize maybe the trouble is I have not amplified the love that I have my children and not only the love that I have for them but the love that God has for us all. You see, this rivalry that comes between children, sometimes it may be somewhat natural, sometimes it may be caused by a neglect. And the greatest neglect, in my opinion, would be for us not to place before our family regularly the joy of the Lord. For a dad to say, next to God, you are my mission field, you are my heart, you are my love, and God loves us and God loves you, and I want to encourage you. How many people walk in life for years for years, walk in life, even into their adult years, and maybe into their aged years, never getting past the fact that they felt slighted at home, that dad never loved them and never appreciated them, never encouraged them. Imagine someone having no more, always no more words to hear, like Hannah, that I'm judged of God, I'm not good enough, something's happened, I've done something wrong. And by the way, it's not just that this comes inside the family. Sometimes we can see it quite easily from outside the family. I'm not, I'm not omitting the idea that we would find this mentioned many times in Scripture. For example, the friends of Job. There was not a person greater than Job. That's God saying that. But yet Job's friends could find many problems with a person who God highly commends. His friends could say, no, Job, you've done something very bad. This could not have happened unless you had sinned. And Job is beginning to hear these complaints and beginning to hear these attacks. And it's it's pressing him down and depressing him because this is how we deal with our problems. We just find some cause and we begin to attack the person and that's all we get. Hannah got it again and again and again. God has judged you. Job got it from his friends. How many of you remember the end of the story where God said to Job, your friends, you better pray for them because they did not speak my word. In our households today, we may have trouble, and it can very well be because love is not prioritized. It can very well be because favoritism is shown in the family. It can very well be because of an unhealthy statement that comes across for whatever reason. Listen, let me ask you a question. Just put it, put everything else out of your mind just for a moment. Let me ask you a question. What is it in your life? that you have done, that you have not been able to accept forgiveness for. You've asked God to forgive you, but still in all, every time you think, I'm going to live for God and serve God, that comes up in your mind. What is it? I'm just asking you, what is it? It's the thing like like Hannah, God has shut your womb. God has closed... 
it just keeps coming up. How many of you know who the accuser of the brethren is? Oh, you knew that already. And he will use any mouthpiece that he thinks you will listen to to get that message before you. Now, I want to speak very loudly here to you. If you're like that and you've lived your life under the condemnation that something happened in your life that you can't get past, today is your day to understand that God loves you and God wants to forgive you and God wants you to put that in the past and God wants you to live a family life that is free of this judgment and condemnation. God wants you to live with the joy of the Lord and to know his love. So I'm telling you, God sent you here today to say you've lived in a family that didn't encourage you. There was favoritism in the family, and maybe there was a mention of things that you've done, and if they didn't say it, some voice has got close to you. It's close to you so that it can say to you again and again, don't forget what you did. Don't forget you remember what you did. I was reading a book uh, in my box that I got from my mother's house. My mother, as you know, is not doing well, and uh, she lives in assisted living, and and uh, she's she has some problems with her memory from time to time. But anyway, we're cleaning up the house, cleaning out the house. I took a box home from the attic that said, memories, Keith stuff, Terry stuff. My brother Terry died when he was 18, right out of high school, had an accident that summer, and uh, went on to be with the Lord. But there were our memory, but there were our memories in a box divided right down the middle by a divider, Keith's stuff, Terry's stuff. I was reading my brother's memories out of his senior book, and people writing in the book, remember the good times we had. And uh, good things, good things. Remember what we did? No mention of what they did. Remember what we did and just kind of a blank and left it. I'll always remember you and things like that. I, I don't know. But you can pick up a book like that and, and you can allow that to be somewhat of a walk down memory lane that you should never walk down again. Can I get a witness on that? Because many times Satan wants to bring us back to something we forgot about but maybe we need to remember, I only ask you this, if you've repented of something that you've done in the past, you should not go down memory lane. But maybe memory lane should be gone down just to get it straight. I don't hold this against my mom or my dad. I don't hold it against my brother or my sister. I lived in this household. Maybe I didn't get the encouragement that they got, but I know one thing. I'm loved of God. I am favored of the Lord. I am His child, and how could I be more blessed? Wouldn't that be wonderful? And so we see that. By the way, on the other side of that box, it's just a little bitty shuffle of papers and not many things on that side of the box. Keith's memories. <laughs> my high school, just so you'll know, my graduating high school class didn't even have an annual. I'm sure that wasn't my fault. <laughs> but on that side, there's, there's few memories on that side. But I do have a lot of good memories. That was just our high school years. I would just simply say that when I look back to my past, I have been blessed, but I realize that many have not been so. I'm glad that I have many many memories to remember of my brother's side because I would rather read those than my side. I know mine. I didn't know his. And so it is always an important thing for us to look at one another with equality in Christ. He loves me as much as he loves you. We're favored of the Lord equally. We're children of God, especially because he chose us to be his. What a wonderful thing. And so I just see in this household the rivalry where I think Penina is always saying, yeah, but the Lord has closed your womb to Hannah. And that provokes her to a, a heartless, relentless attack against her, provokes her to a sense of feeling unworthy. And the Bible says, look at verse 10 with me. 
The Bible says that the verse 6, that she provoked her severely to make her miserable. Look at verse 10. It says, and she was, when she goes to pray, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Now, we've seen this word bitterness before. I don't know if you remember, but when we were going through the life of Naomi and all that she had lost and all that had gone on in her household, and she comes back home to Bethlehem, Judah, and she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara, and that's this word right here, where it says she was in bitterness. It's the same feeling, the feeling that she's judged of God. She's in bitterness of soul, just as Naomi felt that she was judged of God, lost her husband, lost her children, you remember, lost everything, bitterness of soul, because of this rivalry and the constant reminder that the Lord had closed her womb. And so she was miserable, and she was in bitterness of soul. And then, as I said a moment ago, man tries to solve problems like this because Elkanah honored Hannah, favored Hannah, spoke of his love for Hannah. He tried to help her and console her, but you can't console a person with your favor and your love when they feel that the real problem is that God is against them. You can love me as much as you want, but if God is against me, you're not helping. I appreciate it, but it's not helping me. So she leaves this meeting with with Elkanah who's saying, am I not better to you than 10 sons? And goes in verse 10, she is in bitterness of soul and praying and weeping with anguish. Elkanah's solution did not help. You know what I think would be worse for Hannah is if Elkanah's solution had helped. If his encouragement of my love, look how much I love you. I'm, I'm fav-, if that had helped, but that didn't help because I believe Hannah was being pressed by the Lord into a place where she could become absolutely not only blessed of God, but used of God to bring a very special person into the world. The, 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 the trouble in the family did not end with trouble. It ended with a blessing no one would have expected, just like the book of Ruth as we've gone through that. What happened was when Hannah became so bitter in her soul because of the rival or in the constant reminder that the Lord had closed her womb, whether it's with another baby coming on or the first things of a baby or the crying of a baby at night or going to the house of the Lord and, and being reminded that you have no children there and you're not blessed in that sense and she is in bitterness of soul, this is where God really begins to do his work. Man cannot help. How many of you remember when Rachel was in in a similar situation, and she came to her husband, Jacob, and said, she's barren, she can't have any children. You remember? How many of you remember him with me? Say amen. amen. Rachel was barren, a, a wife of Jacob, going back, and Rachel came to her husband and said, what? Give me children, lest I die. She wanted a man's solution, but Jacob looked at her and said, who am I? God, I can't give you children. But we do like man's solution if man can come up with one. But it wasn't man's solution. You can't love me enough, Elkanah. It's something that I feel God, only God can deal with this in my heart, in my soul, in my spirit. She poured out her soul to God and she turned from man's solution, which was I'm favoring you and loving you and giving you. Well, that's not what I need. What do you need? I need a remedy. So Hannah did these things, and I want you to write these things down. If the message has not been clear in form so far, we have the troubles, the two wives in the family, the two wives. One is favored, favoritism. Rivalry begins, provocation with a heartless accusation or attack and then misery comes on. Hannah's miserable. Man's solution, I love you, I'm honoring you, I'm doing more for you. I mean, am I not more valuable than ten sons? That doesn't work. She needs a remedy, and listen to this. Listen carefully. Here's the remedy for you. Let's say in our families today we have some problems. 
And maybe we can't find application to every point that we've used for Hannah's case. But you know in your family there's trouble, whether it's between the siblings, between the husband and the wife, whatever it is. Here's what you have to do to have the remedy. Listen carefully. Number one, you have to disconnect in order to connect. Now, that's very important. That means the thing that's been driving you crazy, the thing that's just causing you most grief, as, as it did with Hannah, the thing that caused her bitterness of soul. She's right now in this text. She's right now. She's before uh, her family. In verse 8, they're having a... They're, they're having a um, verse uh, 7, they're together. They come for the worship of the Lord at the annual meeting, and they're sitting down and eating. She's not eating. She doesn't feel like eating because she's been provoked. Verse 7 says that. So, so here's what she does. She did not eat, and the Bible says, Elkanah said, why do you not eat? But verse set, 9 says, Hannah rose after they had finished eating. They had finished eating. She had not eaten anything. And she's going to pray. She's leaving the situation. Now, that's physically and literally. But I think spiritually and practically for us, she's getting away from the problem that's provoking her to get herself centered and focused in the presence of the Lord. You have to stop thinking about the thing that just is driving you crazy. You have to stop thinking about it. If you're the one that's being provoked in the family, if there's a rivalry between two children in the family, if there's a a conflict between husband and wife, both of you need to unplug from that situation and find yourself in the presence of God alone. Do you understand what I'm saying? Alone. I'm not thinking about it. You're not in the presence of God alone until you can stop thinking about it. Don't think about it anymore. Just right now, I'm not thinking about Penina. I'm not thinking about Elkanah. I'm thinking about my sense of judgment from God. I'm in the presence of God alone. So she had to disconnect to connect. And that's what we have to do. If all I'm thinking about when I say I'm in the presence of the Lord is the things I'm complaining about in my situation, I'm just going over it again and again and again and again, then I'm really not in the presence of the Lord. I have to put all of that out. I'm just alone before God with myself. I'm not thinking about what anybody's doing to me. I'm thinking about me before God. And what she's saying in her heart, and by the way, I just love the way she is before God in this way. She is praying in such a way that Eli has never seen anything quite like this. He thought she was drunk because she was pouring out her soul to God. She is alone before the Lord. She's disconnecting, leaving the table where there's celebration and eating and all of that, leaving all of that, going to get alone before God. Here she is connecting with God. That's what she needs. That's what you need. That's what every family needs, every member of every family needs to disconnect in order to connect. And so there she is before God, and then she determines to devote herself to God, seeking His blessing and His alone, and that's what she's doing. She's praying and praying and praying. I don't need anything. I just need you, Lord. I need you to speak to me. I need you to comfort me. I need you to answer this question. I need to be delivered from this judgment. Whatever it is, God, it's just me and you. I just want you to speak to me. She does make mention of having a child to verify that she is not under judgment, but that's not really the issue. The issue is she wanted to be known as one who was blessed of the Lord. And so she disconnects to connect, and she determines to dedicate herself to seeking God and having nothing other than His blessing. I just want to know Him. This is very important because this is the remedy. And here's what she said. This is her petition. Basically, she's asking God to show her some sign that she is favored of the Lord. A child, well, that would answer it for everyone who is judging her, especially her rival. And I'll show you, God, that this is not, I'm not, I'm not asking just for a child because, God, when you give me a child, I'm going to give him back to you. I just want this to be once and for all 
taken away from my, en- my enemy, that she can no longer say, the Lord has closed your womb. And I will give this child back to you if you give him to me. And by the way, if it could just be a male child, because I would like for him to be in the service of the Lord, being that we're in a family of Levi, that would be wonderful. Just ask him. And she prayed so that she was pouring out her soul so that dedicating herself to devotion to the Lord and then saying to God, I will sacrifice him in service to you, Lord, if you'll just honor this petition. And Eli, who we will see has his own family problems, speaks up and says to her, the Lord grant your petition. I've asked him of the Lord, and I'm going to give him to the Lord. Now, how many of you would put yourself in Hannah's place just for a moment as we close and realize that she has lived with this judgment for so long? It's driven her out of the presence of celebration and in the, in the festival and feast, and she's gone from that. She's in the presence of the Lord. Consider yourself in this position today. I don't know what trouble you have in your family, but I'm telling getting alone with God is the solution. It is the remedy. And not talking about the problem so much, but talking about yourself in the presence of God. God, I need to be delivered from this judgment of God has closed your womb. And so, Lord, just to Give me evidence of that. Give me a child, a male child. And here's what she's saying. And I will give him back to you. And here's what Eli said. Though he doesn't know much about what's going on, he is now standing as a representative of God. And he's saying to her, go in peace in verse 17. And God will grant your petition, which you've asked of him. Now, she didn't have a child as of yet. All she had was an answer. How many of you know you can live in celebration of an answer? It's all you need. Just a word. How many of you know that? And that's exactly what happened. The Bible says when he said, the Lord will grant your petition, the Bible says that she she washed her face. The Bible says that she, she lived as though it was already true. Verse 18, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate and washed her face and was no longer sad. You don't have a child. No, but I'm free. I've got a word. And I'm telling you this morning, whatever your problem is in your family, God wants to speak to you peace. God wants to speak to you love. God wants to speak to you healing. God wants to speak to you the help that you really need in your own heart to be right with Him so that you can celebrate and have just a word. Maybe the situation's not any different. You get home today and it seems to be the same, but God gives you a word that it's about to change and you can hold on to that. And so God gave her a word. She washed her face. She came to the table. She ate. She was no longer sad. And I want you to leave the same way today. I want you to leave knowing that God's going to fix it for you because He's going to fix you and you're part of it. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to fix her heart. And then she can go on. So I'm going to say that after she asked him of the Lord, she said, I'm going to give him to the Lord. And and I'll call his name Samuel. How about that? Because I've asked him from the Lord and God has given me, me this answer. And he's opened my womb. Not only has he opened my womb, he's given me a man child, a male child, and I'm going to give him to the Lord, who, by the way, goes on to be not just in the service of the Lord, he becomes a priest, he becomes a prophet, he becomes the man who anoints the first king and the second king of Israel. He is greatly used of God because his mother went through this trouble and God greatly blessed her for her faith and brought Samuel into the world, a man greatly used of God. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me just for a moment. Those of you who have joined us by internet and are listening in. You have judged yourself so often. Things have gone on in your family that's hurt deeply. Relationships have been severed. 
They need to be fixed, but God wants to speak to you first, not to them, and not to the problem necessarily. What He wants to do is He wants you to rejoice in the fact that He loves you, that He sent His Son to die for your sins, and you know that. He resurrected to give you His kind of life, and you know that. And He's given you every available blessing in Christ Jesus so that there's really no reason for you to feel as though you have been slighted or that you're not honored of the Lord or blessed of the Lord, I should say. And I want you to accept that word from God today. I am blessed of the Lord. I am God's child. I should celebrate. I have gifts I've not yet received because I've not believed for the gifts that God has given me through Jesus. I've not enjoyed the presence of the Holy Spirit. I've not lived and 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 just simply found myself in the Word of God, immersed, receiving God's blessing. I've not done that. I've only been thinking about what's been done to me, what's been said to me, what people are saying to me. Put your mind on God's Word for you today, that He loves you. And He has in things... He has things in store for you that you have never imagined. But he does want you to be willing to sacrifice in order to serve. Give and I'll give, God. I'll own nothing. I'll give everything. I'll serve you and you alone. I'll not say it is what it is, but I will say it is what God says it should be. And I will rejoice in that and take my word home today. So if you're having trouble in your family, turn to God and accept what He's offering you today, His love, His encouragement, and His word of helping you to become what you need to be in His sight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank You that we can just take a word today and walk out and be a different person. We can walk out and leave all of the bitterness, all of the rivalry, all of the provocation and the misery of our past. We can put it in the past as we walk out just with the word that you love us and you have great things in store for us as your children through Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that The families today will walk out and find in their days ahead, many times sitting around encouraging one another with the words that they have in their own heart and make our families become strong for your glory and the joining of our families, the church, become strong for your glory and do this word and work in our life for your glory. And for those who do not know Christ today as Savior, who live under the condemnation all the time, we know as your children that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. May the ones feeling the condemnation of sin come to know the joy of salvation. And for what you're going to do for your glory, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for listening to Loving Christ, the media ministry of New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. If we can minister to you somehow, please call us at area code 225-664-0858. Until next time, get into the Word of God and stay there. This has been a production of New Covenant Church, all rights reserved.